All right. My name is Shilpa Das Gupta. I am the manager at eLearning Support Services. Uh, I take care of Canvas and all the integrations, all the tools that goes into Canvas. So if uh, you have any Canvas related questions and have written or planning to write to the Canvas team, that will be probably me and my colleague Zach, who has been taking some other uh, CTRL sessions as well. Uh, you will find me on the third floor of the Bender's Library. Pretty quiet place, but I love the uh, office. It's, it's an office with a nice view. So if you ever plan to stop by, definitely come to my office. It's room 321 and say hi. And if you have any questions related to Canvas, of course, uh, while you are there, we can happy, uh, we'll be happy to help you with that. All right. With that, let me tell you a little bit about what to expect from this session. So this is a fairly new workshop session that I have been doing uh, in, I would say in the last few months. So this is this is pretty newly designed. The reason uh, I thought of integrating this is because we have so many different tools and functionalities in Canvas. We keep upgrading them as Canvas introduces them, those features. Uh, that's internally from Canvas. And then there are other third party tools that's already integrated with Canvas, not from the company Canvas itself, but other companies, uh, which are extremely helpful in your uh, teaching journey as well. Uh, there are some tools that I have seen uh, are more helpful than others, or I would say uh, in terms of functionality, those are the tools that you might need more than other tools. So I thought of uh, introducing this workshop to discuss more about them, their functionalities. Uh, please keep in mind that these are not the only tools. There are hundreds of tools. I have just handpicked picked these few, uh, again, as I said, based on uh, the kind of functionality that they offer and based on the fact that they are needed more than the other tools. But if you have specific questions related to your course, uh, any specific tools that you might need for your course, I can, I'll be happy to schedule a one-on-one -on -one and discuss about them. Maybe we will not cover this in this session, but we can totally take a look uh, based on your course um, and how it's going to function. With that being said, let me go ahead and share my screen and then we can talk more about the different tools that I have in store for you. If anybody can give me a hands up, whether um, uh, you can see my screen, is everything all right? Yes, we can. Thank you, Hannah. <clears throat> All right, so the first tool that I'm going to talk about is going to be Photo Roster. Now, this is an exclusive AU developed in-house tool. We have introduced it last year, and since then it has uh, it has been extremely helpful uh, from the feedback that we have got from our instructors. In fact, you will be happy to know that this was a tool uh, developed after getting some feedback from the instructors. So if you have some nice idea about any tool that you might, you know, kind of think of, but don't know whether they exist within Canvas or not, feel free to reach out to us. If they already do, we can direct you towards them. If not, we can maybe discuss further about them. And in the future, we can have some, some tool built within in-house at AU and help the community further. So yes, coming back to Photo Roster, as I said, this is an in-house, in AU kind of a uh, tool. You will not find this uh, in other universities, maybe in some other format with some other name, but this is specifically AU based. Uh, the name of the tool is Photo Roster. What it does is it helps you get uh, acquainted with your class much better. Like the name suggests, it's a photo roster. So you can see the pictures of your uh, class, of your students. And these pictures are the pictures that they submitted for their AU ID card. So technically, they are the official AU pictures. Now, you might say that, why do we need a separate uh, tool? 
because within the people area of Canvas, you can still see the name of the students as well as a little thumbnail of uh, their pictures. Now, the main difference between photo roster and the people section of Canvas is that uh, within the people section, uh, people can up upload their own pictures. And since they can change them, they can upload their own pictures, they can upload technically anything. They can upload their pets pictures, they can upload nothing at all. And you really cannot tell them to or force them to upload pictures that way. However, photo roster is, uh, as I said, it's tied to the AUID system. So whatever pictures you see, it's automatically integrated with the AUID system. And that's why they don't live inside your specific course, but they live inside your main Canvas account. And I'll show you how. So this right here, the blue bar right here, it's called the global navigation menu. And whatever options are available here, you will not see the admin panel because that's exclusive to us, our team. Uh, but rest of the options, whatever you see, these are tied to your main AU account. These are not tied to uh, one particular course. The photo roster lives under your account. So if you go to account, that's where your photo roster lives. If you click on it, it will ask you to open in a new uh, window. That's fine, just click on it. It will uh, ask to uh, use your single sign-on, but if you're already in the system, you don't have to do the duo again. And here you will see, for me, it's a different view slightly because I'm the admin, I'm, I'm not teaching any classes per se, but you will. Uh, so in your case, it will be a tad bit different, but let me take an example of uh, an instructor. So this is going to be Michael Piller. He is my manager as well as an instructor at AU. I will select uh, one of the uh, terms. If you, this is your first term, so probably that will be the only option, but if you have taught in the past, you can see those options as well. I will select this. Let's see if he's teaching any classes. Yes, I will take any one of the examples. Okay, that doesn't have a roster. Let's see this if this one has. Okay, here you go. Uh, so when you select one of the classes from the drop down, you can uh, you can pick your classes and then you see uh, all the names and the official pictures of all the students that's enrolled in your class. You can see their uh, name official picture, as I mentioned, their AU ID, their major, and which year they will be graduating, which will kind of give you an idea whether they're uh, senior or freshman and all of that. Uh, I will log out of this quickly because of uh, maintaining discretion. But yeah, overall, that's where you go. And that's how you see the photo roster. And that's how you can get all those details. This is a much better view of the pictures compared to your people area within a Canvas course. And I'll tell you uh, why. Let me go to my um, sandbox course for that. And let me go to people. So if you see, this is the size of the thumbnail in the people area, which is really tiny. And as you can see, some of the students in this class did not upload a picture. That's totally their choice. So, and that is fine if they don't, uh, but that's the that's also can be a problem if you have a large class and you're trying to familiarize yourself with the students and how uh, they might appear uh, for your own um, understanding and for your own knowing the class. So, this is really tiny. And that was one of the problems that instructors also mentioned to the, us that it's difficult to identify with that small of a picture. But in the photo roster, the pictures are really big. Uh, you can get all their details, whatever you get here, which is their login ID, their SIS ID, as well as the additional information that I just showed you. So that's, I think, 
uh, one of the greatest features of photo roster. Uh, you, there is no direct way of getting a printout of your roster. Many instructors have uh, asked me about it, but I have a workaround uh, and let me share that with you guys as well here. Uh, simply go to photo roster when you have the roster ready in front of you, just click control P the regular option on Windows for printout. When you do control P, you, it gives you a printout review. Simply take a printout of that. It's not the best. It might have a little bit of formatting issues, but at least it's better than nothing because it directly doesn't have a printout option that way. All right, I will pause for a bit and I'll do the tr uh, this throughout the session. I'll discuss one tool, pause for uh, some time, just see if you have questions specific uh, to that tool. I can take those, address those and move on to the next tool. Any questions so far? All right, all right, okay. Silence is good in this case. <laughs> Okay, so the next tool that I want to show you is how to integrate the AU calendar in your course calendars. Again, uh, this is an option which Canvas gives you, but the calendar in itself is a customized AU specific one, uh, which will be of course different from other calendars. Uh, why it's important to integrate? Because if you integrate the AU calendar, you can see all the important AU specific dates. So first and last date of the class, last date for add drop period, important holidays, all of that. Uh, please keep in mind that this is something we uh, manually up, uh, upload, uh, like update the events and the holidays. So if you don't see something, feel free to write to us at canvas at american.edu stating that, hey, I don't see this, or is this at all available in AU calendar because it's not part of the calendar itself right now. So yeah, feel free to write to us if you don't see an event, but you know that it might be occurring uh, in near future. To integrate the AU calendar, go to the calendar. Again, as you can see, this is on the global nav menu, not within your course. So this is not just course specific. You can see all your course calendars in the calendar area. So once you are in the calendar area, you will see all your courses listed under calendars. And you can change the colors by going to the three dots. Uh, uh, this might help you with the identification better. And you can also select or deselect which one you are trying to see. If everything is selected, you will see everything. If not, you will see just the specific calendar. But to integrate the calendar, let me actually take this out so that I can show you from the beginning. Okay, to integrate the AU calendar, you have to go to the other calendars, then go to the plus sign, and here right now you will see there is a WCL calendar. You don't have to bother about it if you're not part of WCL, but it's uh, there's also the AU primary uh, calendar. If you select this and click on save changes, here you go. All the important term related dates and holidays will start uh, getting pop like pop up in your calendar area. Now let me show you if there is a holiday. Yeah. So I just went to September and here you go. The Labor Day automatically pops up. Uh, I have got feedback from instructors who have uh, mentioned that this helps in planning for their course and uh, for the activities they have planned. So if you see it already live integrated in your calendar, you it might help you plan the assignments and upcoming any due dates accordingly. So I would highly recommend uh, integrating the AU calendar to your calendar and also the WCL calendar if you're part of WCL. Any questions so far? All right, all right. The next one that I would like to show you is about uh, recording the right pronunciation of your names. 
Uh, now, why is it important? Because at AU, we have so many international students, people coming from different uh, countries and cultures, not uh, possible to know everybody's name, but it is also important to pronounce everybody's name correctly. For that, we have a tool called Name Coach. Now, if you go to your course, and then Name Coach should be there, default, available in your course navigation menu. Now, this was global navigation menu, but this is, since it's inside your course, it's your course navigation menu. If you don't see Name Coach like this one, it says record your name with Name Coach. Very simple, very straightforward. If you don't see it here, not a problem. Just go to settings, go to navigation. If it's not here, it means that it's in the inactive list of uh, applications or tools. It will be definitely available here. Let me actually deactivate it so that I can show you. Okay, I just deactivated it from my menu bar. Here you go. So if it's not available in your navigation menu, it will be in this lower list of all the apps. Simply need to go to this three um, dots and enable it. It will jump up on the top menu options, which means it will also become available in your um, uh, course nav. And then definitely very important small step, but many times we miss it, is to save it. Once you save it, it's now on your navigation menu. Simply go to it, click on it. And I can do the rating later. Okay, now you will see something like this. In your case, obviously, you will see all the listed names of your instructors as well as you here. If they have already recorded their names, you will see the recording here. You can play it by clicking on the little play button. If somebody has not recorded their names, it will be under the unrecorded names. As you can see, I have a couple of names here. And you can actually, <clears throat> sorry, uh, send them uh, an email uh, requesting them to record their names. Also remember, if somebody has already recorded their names for one section, they don't need to do it multiple times. It automatically stays within the tool, within Name Coach, and populates if they have enrolled for another class. And that applies to instructors as well. If you have already done your recording, it will stay there no matter how many classes you're teaching. So you just need to do it once. Uh, Name Coach has its own app as well. Uh, if you are trying to, you know, integrate the uh, pronunciation as part of your email signature, a Name Coach app, the the website itself, I think they give you an option to do that as well. But if you need more information on that, I can find that out as well and uh, share that with you. But for now, for your courses, integrating it within your course, recording your names, encouraging your students to record their names, I think is a great practice to actually pronounce their names correctly. Uh, you can also see when they have uh, uh, recorded their names and when they were invited. If at all, it was inv in an invitation based, you can see those details as well. You can do a little bit of searching here by first name, last name, middle name, and email. If it's a large classroom, probably that can be helpful uh, for you to make it a little more organized. Any questions so far? All right, all right. Okay, the next thing is something which you probably need more than often, which is the library guides, the lib guides. Uh, if you had a chance to talk to any of our librarians, probably they have given you all the necessary resources or probably you are in the process of finding them out. But there is also an option of integrating the guides within your Canvas course. Now, this is a 
fairly new option that we were able to integrate in Canvas, uh, our Canvas environment, just uh, late last year. So that's why I thought including it as part of this session will be helpful for many of you. Uh, to integrate uh, LibGuides, we can do it in multiple different ways. But let me show you the first uh, option, which I think is the most functional, is by going to Modules. Now, if you have already attended the overview session that Zach had this morning, probably you know a little bit about module, but just to give you a very high level overview, modules organize your course based on how you are going to flow throughout the term. So if it's a week by week basis, you can have weekly modules where you say students that these are the things that they need to do in a particular week. Uh, there are other ways of organizing modules, but uh, we can discuss that more during other sessions that we have specifically on modules. Here I have some test modules to integrate LibGuides. I will go to the little plus button. Then from this drop down, I'll go to external tools and scroll down a little bit, go to L in the chronology and choose Lib Apps Spring Share. That's the name of the LibGuide application. I can select that. And now, it asks you, what do you want to choose? But it's basically one option. So just keep the default one. And then from this little drop down again, you can choose what exactly you are trying to integrate from the library guides. You can integrate all the database. You can integrate specific uh, course specific databases as well. So let me choose something real quick. Let's see. Uh, let's do database for specific subject. And from there, let me choose something in specific. Let's choose American studies. And now let me embed that. I will do one more time, add items. And then if you click on American studies, here you go. Now you have the LibGuides specific to American studies. Of course, the course, the program will be different. You can choose from the long list of uh, subjects that's there in the LibGuide, but I just chose American studies and this is all the resources that we have uh, and everything has popped up in it. Uh, I think this is extremely functional because your students don't have to do this search by themselves anymore. It's right there available for them within the courses. All they need to do is click on it and come to this link and they will find everything related to American studies. You can also tell them a little bit in, uh, further in the details uh, to come to this LibGuide and choose something specific if that's the intention. But overall, I think this is a great organized way of directing them to all the resources that's available within the library specific to your course. Any, any questions? Okay, it's no questions, meaning I'm I'm hoping that the session is going good. <laughs> but yeah, feel free to ask me anything. So now that we know how to record our names, now that we know, uh, can you do that again? Uh, John, I'm, I'm guessing you are uh, talking about how to integrate the LibGuides again. Okay, yeah, sure, I can totally show you one more time. So for, I went to the modules. Uh, please remember, we can also do it in assignments. I'll show you in just a bit, but let me show you in modules again. So I'm in the modules area from the course navigation menu. I will. I have already created a module. These are my test modules. If you don't have anything and this is a blank space, all you need to do is first create a module. Let me show you that as well. So I'll go to plus module. I'll just create a test and then I'll create a module. If you already have modules, remember when you create a new module, it appears at the very end. You can drag this and bring it up totally up to you. If not, it, it can still stay at the very end. 
but totally up to how you are going to use it. So I have brought it up just for my ease of functioning. I will go to the plus button one more time. From the little drop down, I will select external tools, scroll down a little bit, go to L, and this is my LibGuides tool, Lib Apps Spring Share. I'll select that, and now comes the more options. Uh, I'll keep it to subject guys default because that's the only option. And then from the further uh, content type uh, drop down, I will select what exactly I need. I can select, as I mentioned, full libguide. I can select single page. I can select a content box, uh, but totally up to how you are trying to function. From there, I will go to database for specific subject just for this uh, demonstration, but you can select other stuff. And from here, I chose American studies, but we can choose so many different options. And here I go. I will just do American studies one more time, embed content, one more time, add items. And that's it. It's right here under your module. Uh, like I said, you can do the same thing within assignments. For that, you will go to assignments, can go to a plus assignment if you are creating it for the very first time. If not, if you are trying to integrate it in an existing assignment, simply go to the edit option of that existing assignment. We will create a test assignment here. I can write details. I'm just leaving it for now. I can put some points here. And let's say uh, for this particular assignment, I need my students to have some kind of libguide, to consult some kind of libguide before they do this assignment. So I can choose it from external tools as well. Go to find, same drill, just the way I showed you for uh, modules, just scroll down chronologically, choose lib apps, and the rest of the options remain exactly the same. So you choose from databases, you choose from everything that you have and embed the content. And that's it, once you save it, it appears as part of the assignment. So you can tell them that for this assignment, you need to do uh, consult, say, uh, one of the content from the LibGuide. That's where you'll probably need this in, in, in assignments. From my experience, I have seen that integrating it in the modules made more sense because it's still there uh, and they can consult it as part of their entire course rather than just one assignment. So just um, something from my experience I wanted to share. All right, all right. Any other questions? Okay. The next thing I would like to show you is course reserves. Now, this is technically not a new integration. It has been there for a very, very long time. However, we still get a lot of questions around it, uh, as in how we can integrate course reserve in my, uh, in my course, that kind of thing. So we have realized that probably not everybody knows the use of course reserve that much. So I thought it would be useful to integrate it as part of uh, this particular workshop. So for integrating course reserves, again, it should be a default option already available in your course navigation menu. However, if uh, not, you can go to settings, navigation, enable course reserve, and that's it. It will be available in your menu. You can go to uh, course reserve. When you are doing it for the very first time, you will probably not even see this, but on top, you will just see one small box, which will tell you to uh, indicate which uh, term you are trying to work in. And just select the current term and this uh, page will pop up. Once in, you are in here, you can start adding reserve items. When, uh, once you click on that, a couple more options open up. As you can see, it's fall 2022 because it's already selected, but for you, it'll be 24, of course. So from here, 
you will see a lot of items from your other classes because you requested them. Uh, and as it says, it part of the current or previously taught cor courses. Since you requested them, it will probably pop up in here. You can import the items again to your current course by clicking on import items. And I'll show you a little more on this, but let me go over all the, all the options that you see in this page first. So yeah, for the previously taught uh, items, uh, you can import it. Uh, you can also view it. When you import it, it also goes in processing, meaning my colleagues from Course Reserve will review it and sort of approve it. It, it doesn't take that much time. They're amazing. Uh, they do it real quick. And once your request is processed, you will see the content like this under this list. However, if you're doing this for the very first time, you will not get a list like this. You will just get something like this. You can make your requests by going to any of these options. Let's say you are trying to request a book. You go to uh, the book option. Bender Library, you have Kadzen. If it's a music and arts course, you can choose that. Uh, you can indicate what's the preferred loan period, but honestly, I don't think uh, it matters for a term course because it, it's uh, available uh, throughout. You can give the name of the book, the author, publisher. I would suggest giving as much detail as possible because that helps uh, the course reserve uh, folks very much to trace it, identify it, and add it to your course. So give as much detail as possible. And then once you're done, simply click on submit item. And you can do this for multiple items. Let me go back. So let's say you're trying to add some kind of media. It can be a documentary, a film, or any other sort of video content. You can go to media, same thing pretty much, but a slightly different kind of uh, um, options to choose from. You can give all the uh, names. Also, I think, yeah, in the notes area, you can give more details. So for example, for videos, I have seen that not always you know probably the exact name or maybe it's not available online, so you can't see those details. But at least in the notes area, if you give as much details as you know about, uh, that will be helpful for them to trace it and add to your content. Uh, they also ask you what kind of reserve item it is. You can select from these options. And then again, you can submit the item. It takes some time for uh, them to review it and add it to your course. Once it's there, as I mentioned, it appears under this list. Uh, and the best part is you if it's something you are going to use in future as well, you don't have to do this drill every time. You can simply import any past content to your current content. Any questions? Okay, now let's come to some of our uh, accessibility tools. Uh, we have a couple of different uh, accessibility options within Canvas, but something that probably you have noticed uh, while working on your uh, courses, if you had a chance, is, let me go to modules to show you that, is something like this, a little S icon. Uh, it's called census access. It basically means that with this tool, you can convert any file. Uh, of course, there's a couple of different file types mm. to accessible format. And when I say accessible format, it has a couple of different options, including Braille. So let's try one and then we will have a better idea of how it works. So I have this uh, doc right here. I will click on this little S icon. And then it asks me what exactly I'm trying to do how, uh, or how I'm trying to convert this file. So I can select from the couple of different options that's available here. Now, from my experience, I have seen that <clears throat> 
MP3 sometimes might have some technical issues, but not always. Uh, maybe it's a technical snag uh, that might happen on the back end, but it's it, it, we can work around that. Uh, maybe on a course to course basis, if you have a problem, we can write to the actual census access, the company and their tech support can guide us better, but just something as a heads up. Uh, you can choose from other options. Uh, let's say I will take ebook. And then it asks me some more conversion param per parameters. I'm sorry. And you can choose what kind of uh, font you are trying. If it's uh, X large, you can totally do that. If it's something uh, you're doing for uh, visually uh, challenged uh, students, you can, I think this is a very important feature that you have large font size. And then you have some formats available as well. This changes based on what conversion type you are choosing here. Once you have done that, it asks you whether you want to uh, email yourself this or download. I, let's say I choose email. And it automatically selects your AU email because it's, it picks it up from your Canvas account. Uh, if you choose download, very simple. You can download it in your computer. And then once you have that file ready, you can simply up, come back to the modules and upload that by going to the plus button. And I just got the notification that it has uh, arrived in my email. So you can choose from here and upload it here. Uh, if it's a file, you can also go to files, upload the file within the file area, and then integrate it under your module by again, coming to the same module, going to the plus button, select file, and select that newly uploaded accessible file format. Uh, not every file might have this symbol, which will probably mean that these files cannot be converted into accessible formats. For example, the libguide itself, as you see, it it will not have it because it's a lot of content. It's a, it's a link to the guides and a lot of them. That's why it doesn't provide you that uh, accessible option. Uh, we have to work around with those kind of situations. But in most cases, uh, for URLs, for uh, images, documents, PDFs, you will get to see this S option. If you think your class might not need this at all, you can go to settings. And you can disable census access inside from here. Uh, if you are having trouble disabling it, or maybe you forgot where to do it after this session is over, you can always write to us at canvas at american.edu requesting it to be turned off for your course, and we will be happy to do that as well. And I will pause again just to see if you have any questions related to census access inside. All right. Uh, there's also another way of integrating census access. Let me show you that as well while we are discussing this. That is to have it in the course navigation menu. So for example, uh, I had one instructor who asked me that they do want census access, but they don't want to have that icon beside each item in their course. Uh, they wanted to disable it, which we did for them. But to ha still have it in his course, what we did was we went to navigation and added census access as part of the navigation menu. To do that, like I said for the previous ones, just go to this three dots, enable it. It jumps up on this menu list and make sure to save it. Once you do that, it will appear right here. It does pretty much the same jobs, nothing too uh, different. If you go to census access and it's loading, so it's taking a little time since I just integrated it. 
It does the pretty same job. It asks you what you want to do, what you want to convert. You select the file, you give the accessibility format in which you're trying to change it, and then it uh, tells you to uh, download the file and then you can upload it again. What the census access inside the little symbol that we were just discussing does is makes your job slightly easy. You don't have to select your item, but it's already there available beside the item like a button. So that's the primary difference, I would say, in terms of functionality, ease of functionality. Other than that, both of them does the same job. And yeah, while we are talking, right here it is. So we can choose what we are trying to do. We can choose which file we are trying to uh, convert. You can choose something like whichever uh, uh, file it is. And then it requests you which format it's trying to convert. You can choose and then it gives you an option to, let's say I'll do this. I will choose large and then it asks whether uh, it's going to deliver uh, in your cam campus email or not. I will do that, of course. And that's it. So it's pretty similar. Uh, personally, for me, I like the can census access inside little button uh, because while seeing it, I can quickly identify, okay, this is the file I want to convert and I can do it immediately. So I find it a little more helpful in terms of functionality, but otherwise there's really not much difference in terms of whether you are adding it here or uh, you have it enabled in your course overall. All right, and then there's one uh, specific Canvas functionality I wanted to make it part of this workshop because I, again, uh, this is, I have found it very helpful in uh, certain situations and I'll tell you what, this is not really a tool, a separate tool, like the way we were discussing these tools, like census access, like name coach. This is not really a separate tool, but actually a functionality of Canvas. Now, again, to remind you, this is just one or two uh, of the functionalities that we are discussing here. There's so many different options available that's, uh, that might be needed for your class, but we haven't discussed here. So feel free to reach out. Now, let me go to grades. <clears throat> the next uh, Canvas feature that I wanted to highlight is called Submit for Students. Now, let me go to one of the assignments, you can access it by going to the grades area like I just did. I went to grades and now you can go to any of the uh, submissions, any of the assignments. Definitely after the due date is over, people have made their submissions. This feature becomes functional after that. So let's say uh, Eric here has submitted a file. Uh, let's say we, we haven't graded them he is not sure whether he has submitted the right file or not, or he had some technical issues submitting his file. As an instructor, you can help the student to submit his document or his work on his behalf. For that, you will simply click on this little dash, or if you have already graded, you can um, select uh, the, that grade. Let me take this. Uh, let me show you how to select that. Simply click on this little dash. Go to this little arrow. And right here, what pops up is a side panel with some more options. And here you will find the submit for students option. If you click on it, it asks you to upload a file. Here you can select the submission that probably uh, your student has emailed you because they had problem submitting it themselves. You can select the file, hit submit. What happens is after you have uh, submitted it on, uh, on behalf of your students, let me go to speed grader real quick. It shows you instead of showing the student's name, it shows your name. And it tells that you have submitted on behalf of, say, Andrew or Ashley. And it also gives you a timestamp. 
So that, uh, that way, it's very clear to you and your students who have submitted it, if you have done it on behalf of your students or not, and what's the time. Uh, sometimes, maybe the students have missed a deadline and maybe you have decided not to extend it any further for them. In that case as well, this might be a helpful uh, feature if you have allowed the student to still submit their work for any excuses that it may be. It can be a health issue or something else. Uh, so you can submit on their behalf, put the grades, whatever it is, but on the submitted area, you can see that you have submitted it. And even students can see that you did it for them uh, on their behalf. So this is one of the many, many, many features that Canvas has. We recently had an upgrade of Canvas as well for which we have uh, some new features in discussions, assignments, and also rubric. But if you are using it for the first time, if you're using Canvas for the first time, probably you, uh, good part is you already have those features from the very beginning. Uh, but this is a feature which many instructors miss because it's kind of you know small and hidden, uh, but I have found it very, very functional, very helpful uh, for my instructors. So I thought of including it in this workshop as well. That was the last of uh, the features and tools that I wanted to highlight. We have quite a bit of time. So if, uh, if you have any questions, I think this is a good time to discuss or you can include it in the chat. All right, if there's no more questions, I'm glad to give you back some, uh, some minutes uh, of this session. And thank you for joining this, uh, this session with me. And for everybody's knowledge, I will also leave the Canvas email in the chat. Thank you so much for joining. You're welcome, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.